The MMA Discussion Podcast is brought to you by SportsOfAnarchy.com. Visit our site for all your sporting news and needs. We're also brought to you by SubmissionFC.com. Enter the promo code SportsOfAnarchy10 for 10% off the best Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gear. Uh, we are also available now for viewership on iTunes and Stitcher app, both available on all uh, smartphone devices for free. Um, believe me, if uh, storage uh, devices, you know, you have problems storing any storage unit data all that stuff stitcher app is the way to go it's a radio app sign up subscribe review, review listen comment we appreciate it all welcome mma fans the mma discussion episode 22 i'm here brought to you with my co-host chris powell you can say what's up hey guys what's going on actually i just wanted to mention that i'm looking into getting us going on uh google hangouts and we might have video available sometime soon bro that'd be dope that would be cool i think we'd get more viewers that way um yeah that would be nice. see my ugly mug <laughs> we also have a special guest on here with us a good friend of both of ours me and chris uh daniel clark daniel say what's up uh what's up everybody tell uh, everybody just a little bit about yourself where you're from favorite fighters and such well i'm, I'm from england doncaster specifically it's a bit of a Crap all, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite fighters. I don't really have favorites as such, but I like people like Miles Jury, Jeremy Stevens. Yeah. Cool deal. Um, well, Lions, boys. Yeah, well, we brought you on here uh, as a special guest. We appreciate you coming on. Uh, we feel like uh, we might do this more often, have some uh, fans on even maybe possibly in the future. We'll see how this one goes. Um, for, yeah. I'm sorry to say that again. Uh, thanks for having me, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, we're going to start this off. Uh, as of press time, it hasn't been completely officialized yet, but uh, multiple sources close to the UFC have uh, hinted at it and even just flat forward said it that Uriah Faber versus Frankie Edgar will headline the UFC fight night in Manila in the Philippines going down May 16th uh, later on this year in the spring. I can't wait for that fight. That is crazy. It's supposed to, it's, right now it is, um, it is Wednesday. Uh, as of press time, we don't. It's not been officialized yet. So not not only that, it hasn't been uh, completely sit, stated as to which weight class this will be in, whether at bantamweight, featherweight, or like a catchweight of some sort. Um, I think personally, it's best that it be put on uh, like maybe a, a 140 catchweight. I just feel like that's the the most fair since Faber hasn't competed at 145 in such a long time. Um, and as well as I don't think, you know, Frankie Edgar dropping a whole division out of the blue uh, is the best thing for him to be doing right now. So I feel like 140 or 145 is, is the best option, though, for best men, for both men, I think it, it 140 is the best. Chris, what do you think of this matchup, and what do you think? I mean, how can you not be excited for this matchup? We have former WEC champion in favor. We have former UFC champion in Edgar. And these guys are basically the two best guys in their divisions who aren't the champions. At least at the moment, we have Cruz out, but Faber is still basically number one right now. Edgar is number one in the division. So, I mean, I, I love both of these guys. It's just going to be a really fun fight to see. And I, I'm i not opposed to 140 or 145. I just don't think it would be a good idea or make much sense for Edgar to drop down to 35 and fight Faber there just because he's at – uh, in line for another title shot, especially if he wins this fight at 145. Yeah. Daniel Clark, well, are you excited for this matchup, and what do you think? Yeah, well, I think it's perfect time for them both to fight, to be fair. Uh, I think they both stylistically match up well. well. They're both about five foot six, aren't they? Something like that. Yeah, they both match up, I think, uh, both yeah. in size. I think... Uh, Reach. Reach. Yeah, exactly. I think the – what is it? I think Frankie is actually pretty long reach for his size. I think he's like 71 yeah. or something like that. These guys are both basically like the same size human beings. Yeah, um, but they but their styles are somewhat different. They're somewhat oh, yeah. uh, almost almost con very, very contrast in their styles is in that favor is uh, more of, of a submission grappler. Uh, Frankie is more of a wrestler who likes to uh, pound on you, beat on you. and then But he, in his last fight, he did get catch a submission – Something he rarely ever does, um, but he also looked much improved on uh, with his uh, with his offensive top game and ground and pound and transitioning and positioning, um, and so uh, you know as well as uh, when he fought uh, BJ, he, he looked more dangerous there as well. So I mean, it just seems like he's uh, improving on the ground as well and in striking. Um, 
Frankie is more fluid in his movement, I feel, in boxing, pure boxing, but he mixes up kicks really well. Faber has always been unpredictable in his stand-up, and, and it seems like uh, it's tightened up due to having uh, Martin Campman and uh, Dwayne Bang Lug with it, uh, to help him out in, in recent years, so uh, it's definitely an exciting fight. Fun fact, for both men, Frankie Yeager hasn't lost a, a fight outside of a title fight since his fight with Jim Miller, which was back in 08. So that's seven years. He's undefeated in non-title fights uh, since then. And uh, and Uriah Faber Wait, is somewhat... Edgar lost, to, Edgar lost to Miller? I believe so. I could be wrong. That's just going off memory from what I remember. I remember watching... I he, I'm pretty sure he won that fight, I, if I'm remembering correctly. Let's look it up. Um, yeah, no, he beat Jim Miller. Did he? He lost to somebody yeah, he, at lightweight. Who is it then? Oh, Ray Gray Maynard. Maynard. That's what I'm thinking of. My silliness. Uh, let me see. Yeah, Gray Maynard. That was his. That was his, uh, in uh, April second of '08. Yeah, I'm sorry. I mean, that was my mistake. He beat Jim Miller. That's my bad. Gray Maynard in '08. Uh, and so that's the seven-year undefeated run outside of title fights, which is uh very impressive. And then for Uriah Faber, I believe is on the same boat. Just so I don't make a mistake, I'm gonna look it up. Let me see. Yeah, as I looked, um, I was looking for their reach, Edgar. They have two different reaches for him. On Wikipedia, it's 68, and on like ESPN, it's 72. That's a very big difference. Yeah, I if, know. Let's just and, let's just average that out and say it's 70 for now until we can get like you know let's go on YouTube.com. Yeah. That's and probably the best Faber, way to go. Faber on Wikipedia, he's 67, and on ESPN, 69. <laughs> Nobody can get and this he, shit right. Um, uh, on most things for Faber, it's about 69. So either way, I'm going to say it's about a two-inch reach advantage right here. Yeah, okay. I say, wow. So, okay, and but for Faber, and I've looked it up, the last time he lost a fight uh, that was a non-title fight um, was against Tyson Griffin back in 2005. <laughs> so he's gone undefeated in title fights for about 10 years now. Non-title. Non-title, yeah. <laughs> non-title fights, so everybody knows I'm not talking out of my ass or anything. I looked this up. <laughs> um, yeah, that was and and so out of all seven of his defeats, six of them were in title fights. So he has lost six fights since then, all of them in title fights. Um, that's a crazy statistic to think about, and it makes for a very pr in in intriguing matchup because this is one where you can look and say, "Oh, okay, whoa, who's gonna win this one?" I tend to lean towards. Frankie, I feel like uh, there's just more momentum on his side right now. I feel like uh, he's improving as to where Faber kind of is improving. But at the same time, in his last fight, he seemed to be a little slow. Um, I don't want to say age is catching up to him or, or you know, just or anything like that. But uh, just his last performance was certainly not his best. Yeah, um, I feel um, stylistically, I think, as you said, Edgar is better on the feet. I think he's a bit more technical. And his hands, I think that's going to be a big part of this fight because they're probably going to cancel each other out with grappling-wise. I think if anyone gets it to the ground, I think Edgar might have a better shot at taking Faber down than Faber rule of taking Edgar down. I'm not sure. Like, I, I just feel like Edgar's wrestling, he's been able to take down basically everyone he's gone against. While Faber's been a good wrestler as well, but he, he has had a little bit of trouble taking a few guys down, like, uh, Jose Aldo, he couldn't get him down there. Fight while Edgar took him down twice, I believe. So, I mean, yeah, I could see Edgar being a little bit better everywhere than Faber, aside from uh, submissions. And as long as he doesn't get taken down or reversed and choked, I think he has a really good shot of winning this fight. And this fight is basically, it's basically a super fight if you really think about it. I mean, it's as close to one as you can get without mm -hmm. actually calling it a super fight. This is certainly one of those big money fights, and I'm excited for it. And, you know, I was calling for it at the beginning of this year. I'd love to see more of them. And uh, and we're getting some. I like it. I'm totally on board. Daniel, how do you see this fight going? I, I like Edgar, I've got to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much what you said, it took words out of my mouth. I just, I just see him beat it. I don't know. For me, I don't really see Faber posing that much. I mean, he's, he's amazing, but I don't see him posing that many problems for Edgar. Yeah, for so me, I feel like Edgar is the more offensive wrestler. He, 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 especially this, he's able to change levels so much better than Faber, I feel. I feel Faber uh, has never really 
figured out the timing of a takedown from the strike. I mean, he's he's done it. Sometimes he's had some uh, some success in that. But Favors, or I mean, uh, Edgar is way better at it. You know, being able to come in with combinations, uh, get out of the way, not only get out of the way, but also find angles and getting a uh, getting a leg or finding the hips and getting a takedown. He's so much better at that than Faber, I feel. So, yeah, uh, as you were saying, Chris, I think it's it's almost much more obvious that Faber or, or that Edgar is uh, more – uh, talented, I feel, in being able to get the, the the fight to the ground. Sure, Faber has been able to get others to the ground. You're right. Uh, with the Aldos, probably the best example. But um, there are other guys who have been able to stifle Faber uh, from getting a takedown. Uh, and not a lot of guys can stop Edgar. I can't think of many people who have been able to stop Edgar. Even BJ Penn, one of the best guys, even when he was champion, when they fought for the belt, Edgar was able to get PJ ben, uh, Penn to the ground uh, multiple times. So it just shows how how, uh, how how unpredictable in shooting for the takedown and changing levels, mixing it up, that, that Edgar is more so than Faber is. So, yeah, that's why I lean more towards uh, Frankie Edgar. That, uh, thus far right now, no official word on the weight class uh, again, as we said. So, uh, like I said, I would prefer this be at 140. Clark, what do you, uh, what weight class do you think that this would probably be best at? I, I think they do it at 145, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I feel like 140, 145 is the best. 140 for, to be fair for both men. Uh, I but, think 145 is the most likely. Probably, situation. you know. Um, at because the same, if Faber loses at 45, it doesn't really change much. But if Edgar loses outside of 45, it could affect the division a lot more. Well, how so? Also, I feel like Faber, if he lost that 145 to Faber, it would affect the uh, it would affect him getting a title shot much. Oh no, that, more I than, said it would affect Edgar if he lost, but I mean, if he lost at 35 or if he lost at 40, I mean, if he lost at 45, I, yeah, that would suck too. But Faber could always move up if he wanted to because Dylan Shaw's champ now. But if Faber would have, I don't know, I'm, I have my words jumbled up a little bit, but. I, I think it's most likely going to happen at 145. Yeah, I kind of get that sense that it might. I just feel like 140 is the best because it, whoever loses, it won't affect them too much in their standings. You know, Because, like, say Faber and Edgar does happen at 145 and Faber wins. That does a lot to um, affect Frankie because I honestly feel like uh, he's next for the title here. Um, I think he could. What he could have done, he could have just sat out and waited for McGregor and Aldo. And he, his name just, you know, is the, it, you know, makes the most sense. But also at the same time, you never know what can happen from now until uh, July, which is when that fight's going to happen, McGregor and Aldo. So you never know how much the uh, the division can, and the landscape can change. So it's good that he's staying busy, and it's and it's the best case scenario that he's taking this fight. So. Um, yeah, and considering if Aldo were to lose, he would likely get a rematch against Connor. So yeah, that lame, could even but, put it off yeah. longer, and it would be pointless for him to wait around. Exactly. So a best case scenario going on here, M big money fight. Uh, I don't. Uh, the thing that that I worry about though is it is going to be in Manila in the Philippines, which makes which leads me to believe that this might be a fight pass card. Um, so uh, not that I have a problem with it. I have fight pass, but I, I we all talk we all hear from fans all the time that talk about fight pass sucking and not having it and not wanting it and never using it and this is if there's ever the time to get your subscription going this would be the fight to do it for i, I feel so uh you know big bargaining chip on the ufc's part to get to get you to get their uh, their fight pass uh, no matter what i'll watch it but yeah it just it would have been nicer for it to be on tv than on uh, fight pass yeah i mean we don't know that yet but you're probably right there and um I think we should move on to some unfortunate news. Yeah, uh, we will. I'm Hector Lombard testing positive for uh, an amp, uh, a, a, a steroid that people seem to be confusing for. Uh, what's the drug again? DMT. Dimethyltryptamine. Yeah, that. And that's not what this is. I, I've been talking to fans this, <laughs> just this morning of people telling me, why is he getting popped for DMT? What's he doing that for? Or I didn't even know that you could get popped for that. Or da da da, da. And, it's, and it's not that. It's the drug he got popped for is desoxymethyltestosterone. Desoxymethyltestosterone, which, yeah, which is steroid. in the steroid world is, yeah, nicknamed DNT. It's, it's a diff but it's not that one. It's not that. It's not that crazy drug that you can get high off of or anything. It's a steroid. It's a it's a testosterone um, type steroid that uh, 
that unfortunately Hector Lombard got caught with. It was why his fight with Roy McDonald is now out. And this is just another issue that I feel where, man, it took a long time for that to come out. Because when did that last fight happen? Uh, UFC, uh, January 3rd. So it was like over a month ago. And um, and I'm just thinking like, wow, that, that was, oh yeah, over a month ago. Man, I, why did it take so long for this to come out? It's become an issue that, you know, a lot of people are, are worried about now that um that y you wonder what's the point of the testing at this point if they're gonna get it after the fact you know it, it, kudos to them for them to you know obviously say it hey we, he tested for this you know he can't be in that matchup da, da, da. so rory mcdonald now without a dance partner uh i guess for rory there's certainly a silver lining here um but we'll get to that in a sec. But just uh, the, the the fact that Hector Lombard is now popped, that is a that's a lot of guys already uh, that that is affecting the welterweight division. Not only that, that's those because um, now Kelvin Gastelum seems to be one of the top ten ranked guys in that division, who will soon be moving up to middleweight, of course, because of uh, his latest uh, weight mishap. Um, so that's one contender out. Now you have Hector Lombard, who is in the top five, I believe, uh, somewhere near it. Um, and uh, and and now he's out for a, a probably a good amount of time. He will have a hearing, I believe, in April or so to, to uh, you know address. Or actually, well, I feel like I think in February they might pass down a suspension on him uh, in, in in mid February this month. Um, in which case, it'll probably be nine months, a year, a year and a half. Who knows? Um, and so that's another contender out at welterweight, and that's just very unfortunate. And of course, with all the things going on with John Jones and Anderson Silva, it's just this has become such an issue with uh, with PEDs, man. Um, and uh, uh, man, it's just so difficult to really comprehend how bad this is getting in in the time span of a month and a half that it's been since this month started. I mean, it's crazy because one of the biggest stories that I was talking about last year that I'm glad uh, you know that made 2014 a good year was that they were able to finally get rid of testosterone replacement therapy. That that was just, you know, kaboom, it was gone. And so now this year it's become more of an issue of the athletic commission and the way that they handle their testing. And, you know, it's good that the, the random testing is, in, is being implemented because you're seeing uh, essentially a high success rate of all these guys getting caught. Um, but at the same time now, uh, it's become such an issue where now you're wondering where a lot of guys were saying, yeah, like 40, 50 percent of guys in the UFC or in MMA are, are taking these performance enhancing drugs. It's kind of scary to believe that it may possibly be true with so many guys you know, coming out, you know, coming out of the blue with uh, get popping positive for a lot of stuff. And so um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, what are, what are your thoughts, uh, Chris? Uh, yeah, I think this is just another day, another steroid at this point. But um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I think it's. I'm not surprised that Hector Lombard, especially, tested positive for steroids, even though it's unfortunate. Because I mean, look at the guy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no normal human being is even athletes really look like that. It's very rare, at least. And um. I'm not too surprised by it. Neither are a lot of other people. I think it's unfortunate because it takes away a contender out of a division that most of the top guys have already fought each other, and there's it needed new blood. It also takes away from um, a title shot that Hector could have had if he beat Rory McDonald, which is very possible. And now um, I think it does play out well for Rory because he could get the next title shot like he was supposed to get, and I think he deserves against Robbie Lawler which was put off because, of course, they were going to book Lawler versus Hendricks, but then Lawler wanted to wait, and they booked Hendricks versus Brown, and they had McDonald versus Lombard already booked. So I think it's very possible that Rory get a shot, which is really good. And I think it's obvious that PDs are a real problem in this sport. A lot of guys are getting caught now, and I think it's a problem that they didn't announce until a month later. What's the point? If you're doing tests, this – I mean, that was the test after the fight? Yes, post-fight. Which uh, It was a post-fight test. But I mean, even just in general, why are they doing tests that are going to take a month to get back three weeks out just because they don't want to mess up the fights? I, guess. I don't know why they're doing that. It doesn't really seem to make much sense to me. And then a post-fight test shouldn't take a month to come back. It really, what, most of them come back a few days later, and now we're hearing about this now, which, again, doesn't make much sense. And I'm not, I don't have... 
I guess there's not enough information to really say why it came back so late, why it's taking so long to get these results back. But it does seem a little bit shady by the NSAC, and I'm not sure how in- involved the UFC is with the getting the res- uh, results of the drug test out there. But I think a lot of the blame falls on the NAC just because if they're making the money from this. They're making the money from these fights, especially with the Anderson uh, drug test and the John Jones drug test, which obviously wouldn't affect the fight as much as Anderson's failed drug test did. But I think they're getting a good amount out of it, especially when the, and then they're finding these guys and they're making money off of the fines too. So I, I think it's just a little bit of possibly a little bit of corruption going on. I don't Possibly. know. Yeah. It's, I, it's just it's a black eye on the sport, and it's gonna keep getting worse before it gets better. I think. Yeah, Daniel, as a as a fan of MMA, I mean, what, what, from where you're sitting, what are your what are your thoughts on all, uh, on what's going on this year thus far with PEDs? Uh, I think something weird's happening at the Nevada Athletic Commission. I don't, I don't know what's going on, but obviously there's some corruption, like Chris said, it's something dodgy. Uh, I swear to Lombard. It was only a matter of time that he was going to get caught. Oh, he's, he's nearing, what is he, about 37 years old now. So, yeah, still it's, looking as good as what he does. Yeah, it's it's so unfortunate. I I feel like what what there needs to be is is harsher punishments at this point. And in one in, in one case I felt was unfair where Silva, or Vanderlei Silva last year dodged the drug test and then got banned for life. Now that's being contested still, and that might actually change considering Silva wasn't tested and it just kind of put – the, the, it makes the NAC look bad in, in the sense that they kind of you know ruin their own case by by completely banning him from the sport, um, at least in their jurisdiction, uh, when uh, he wasn't licensed or anything. So uh, with that, that's the only type of outside or out of competition drug testing that is not good. Like you're not supposed to be able to do that. But at the same time, outside uh, you know out of competition drug testing obviously makes the most sense. But I've heard from interviews. Um, from various doctors, uh, especially after the Hector Lombard thing, because I wanted to, you know, hear wh- what certain doctors would say just by physically looking at Hector, a guy like that, um, and a lot of guys, especially uh, this one doctor, I can't remember his name though, but I want to give him credit for having said this. So I'm gonna look his name up while I'm saying this. Uh, came out and said, you know, um, they they have certainly made a mistake. The John Jones test that could have pop- that could have easily come out before the John Jones fight. Uh, same with the Silva testing and the uh, and Hector's testing. But the thing is, is that whenever these tests are done, uh, they send these to the lab where it goes. Uh, they're specialists to where they, uh, you know, t- uh, test these uh, urine and blood samples. And, uh, you know, they don't like uh, test them more than two or three times. Um, so at max. And this, but the crazy thing is that when they're testing these, they don't test them and say and see and like a name on them. There's just numbers on these vials of, of blood and urine that they test for drugs. And uh, and so you know, there's never any kind of um, uh, date set to where they want them back. But I feel like that that's exactly what they need to be doing. They need to go to these labs and say, hey, look, uh, we th- we have an event. Uh, all the all the fighters on this on the event are, are uh, have taken these drug tests. I need you to test them, and we need them back with like at least two weeks before this event. You know what I mean? Um, you know, because imagine some something something does pop up in there. They want to be able to say, hey, this is the this is the sample that was uh, that popped for this this and this. They let the uh, they let the commission know. The commission finds out who it is. The commission tells the UFC, and the UFC can react accordingly because then you just kind of put the UFC in a bad position if you if you find it out like two days prior or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, and I feel like at the same time there also need to be harsher punishments for guys that get caught because you kind of get what Hector is going to get like a year or nine months or something like that and a fine. Now that's all well and good, but at the same time you got to kind of make some guys more scared of it. Um, you know, guys that have popped before, if they popped again, then you kind of like give them two years and a crazy fine, you know, because it's within their own jurisdiction to make it. And then even if a fighter wants to contest it in the sense that, you know, I, I shouldn't be suspended that long or, oh, I shouldn't be fined this much, they would still have to put in money and time to fight it and this and that and the other. And then you just find out at the end of it, it was never worth it. 
You know what I mean? It was never worth it yeah. to, to do it. You, you spent all this money to defend yourself, you're st- and then you find out, you, and then you lose the, the anyway because it's within the commission's jurisdiction to to set their own policy on how they fine and punish fighters that do this. And I think yeah, it should think be a little they, more harsher. You know I what think I mean? The UFC needs to get a little bit more involved here. I think they need to. I they were gonna do all the out of competition drug testing for all the athletes, but then they decided not to. I think they should have went along with that because I think it would be very helpful in improving the sport. Because yes, it's going to cost a lot of money, but it's worth it. Because do I mean if you want to catch these guys and you want to clean up the sport, you got to do that. You but see, that. that's where you sit down and wonder: Do they even want to catch these guys anymore? Now they're they probably get a little worried. How many guys are doing this? Oh, yeah. Is it really an issue? Is it such an issue that it's going to cost us so much financially and so much in the popularity poll and and as a sport in total because you say yeah it's uh it's good to be able to catch these guys but at the same time each time they, that we, that somebody gets caught it seems that the that the that the morale of the sport i guess you could say just dwindles down a lot and uh and and like i said i think it is a good thing that they catch these guys but at the same time, you, then you feel like, oh, I mean, what's the point of watching if all these guys are popping, da 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 da, da. It's such a very, very fine line that, uh, that I feel yeah. like at the same time, uh, it, it's up to the commission to really, you know, uh, to, uh, not just up to the commission. I do agree that the UFC should be involved. I do agree that, they, that there should be more strenuous testing and, and, that they, and that they should be on board with everything that the, the athletic commission has been doing as far as doing out-of-competition testing so long as they're licensed. Um, the but UFC you, gets involved outside of the U.S. with the commissions, like in um, whenever they go outside of the U.S. when or Canada, and they there are no commissions. The UFC is basically the commission. They sanction all the fights. They get all the yeah, exactly. refs and everything like that. I think they have to be more involved, and I think they can be more involved in administering out of competition drug tests if they want to be looked at as. Um, a mainstream sport, as they've been claiming, they're oh, we're gonna we're a mainstream sport, blah blah. If they want to be looked at that way, they have to do the other things that all the other mainstream sports are doing, which includes testing. And they also have to get more involved when a guy, when a guy, they have to make these guys scared of testing positive, scared of taking steroids. They have to, if a guy tests positive, they have to include a fine. They have to be strict about this, so the guys aren't like, oh, okay, so what if I pop positive, I still if I, I might not get caught, and if I do get caught, I'm going to be out for nine months. Daniel, what do you think, if any ideas you would have to uh, improve this situation at all, if at all? I mean, I can't expect too much of an answer, but it's because it's, we're all kind of with our hands in our pockets here. Yeah, I'm just rubbing my forehead thinking. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not too sure. What, what can I do? <laughs> yeah, it's it's such a difficult conundrum we're in because you know each each move uh, uh, there are positives and negatives to each and every move that come forward because yeah catching all these guys is a good thing but then you're also thinking like wow this is so many guys getting caught um you know a, a good thing uh, like I said my idea is just you know much more harsher punishment it's within the commission's uh um power to be able to uh, essentially you know change up or edit these uh these punishments to to fit you know uh you know to fit more harshly i do i do not feel that um this is my own my own opinion i don't, I don't you know and i doubt that the nac would ever uh come up with this on their own to you know that the, the depending on the drug like if it's a ped or testosterone up the route like with john fitch john fitch is another one of these names that has come out recently and pop positive for a very high levels of testosterone, not PEDs as as what many people have come to believe, though it might have been because of PEDs that his testosterone was so high, uh, but it was because of uh, high testosterone that he got popped. Um, so, but uh, you know, it, it, for guys that get popped more than once, I think that there should be like a punishment where you know you, you get fined an insane amount to where the next time you fight might not even cover it all. Like I know that I remember saying that um, you know when uh, John Jones got uh, fined 25 G's uh, from a from a 500 thousand uh, dollar disclosed payout, uh, I thought that was kind of silly. That's not a lot for him. You know what I mean? For for each for depending on the status of your paycheck, 
or, or or how much you make or your contract or something like that should be mirrored onto how how your punishment is should you pop positive for any kind of performance enhancing drug or testosterone uh levels in that uh in that fight you know so say like john jones got that 500 g's for that daniel cormier fight only got uh twenty five thousand dollars uh pay now for uh for your average fighter I know that that's a lot. Like, say somebody that just comes into the UFC probably doesn't even make that much unless they get like a fight night bonus. You know what I mean? And then even if they pop, they don't even get the fight night bonus. So, I think that you know fines like those are good for the guys that are in the mid level to even close signing because then they think, oh man, if I you know what's the point of fighting for the UFC <laughs> if I'm gonna pop and then I gotta give up all of my check and more? You know what I mean? It, it, I, I feel like it would really put such a fast stop to that uh, at the lower bottom. And then at the top barrel, I feel like there should be tiers just like there will be when the Reebok deal comes out to how much you get fined. And I think that there should be tiers. Like if for the champion, you get you get charged the most if you pop positive. And then if you're like in the top five, you get popped the second most and, and, and just work your way down more and more. Daniel, you were going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say maybe a structure it as if, if, you're, if you're the main event, you get – find more if you're the co-main event obviously you get find more than whatever is on the prelims yeah exactly i just feel like there should be a tier system for guys that are ranked or even if they're just put on a higher placement on the card even uh however that works i, I feel like that you know just putting that in placement would really instill fear to say to these guys look you do this this is what's going to happen i mean because we already get a general sense of this is what's going to happen but it's like so many guys pop for it now, or for no matter what it is, whether it's weed or performance enhancing drugs or testosterone or anything silly or even diuretics at this point, um, that, uh, that, you know, you get nine months, you get a year, you get a certain fine. That's not more than like maybe, uh, what, 12, like I, I believe, uh, Ashley Evan Smith is in danger of paying off about 12,500. Now that's a lot. I guess for her, it was her first fight, uh, in the UFC, I believe when she fought, uh, Rocky, what's her name? Raquel Pennington. Yeah, Raquel Pennington. Um, and so, uh, and I figure that's a lot considering she lost and didn't get a win bonus enough. So I, w I would think a person coming in on a first fight contract gets about eight thousand to show, eight thousand wins. So she probably didn't make that much. Uh, you know, so um, that is a that is a fair fine. I feel, or you know, something around those long along those lines. That and twenty thousand. Even though I don't agree that diuretic should have been the reason she got popped, but. Um, if there is any performance enhancing um, supplements in it, then I, I would agree on it. But I have to research that more. So, and we will moving forward because uh, she also in mid February will get a uh, a hearing done to just uh, talk about what her punishment will be and all that and such. But like I said, uh, and Chris, you can shine on one uh, one last time about it. I just think that harsher punishments need to be uh, implemented at this point because it's it's showing that. You know, all these fighters are going to be put out, and it, and and these are high level fighters, high high uh you know you know high on the food chain in, in respect and in, in, uh, in respect to rankings and all that. So it, it makes a big deal, and it, it and it, and because it does, it needs to be shown that it's a it's a much bigger deal when you get caught these days because of the fact that it's becoming an issue. Chris, what do you think? Last thoughts. Yeah, I think it's just a it's a big problem. It's they can't keep taking it lightly. I mean, the UFC was when Anderson popped. They were like, "All right, we're gonna leave him on the Ultimate Fighter. We back him." And obviously, he's been taken off of the Ultimate Fighter. But yes, oh, we I didn't mean, even announce that on here. But yes, uh, he is no. no longer the coach on the Ultimate Fighter season four. He's been replaced by uh, Big Big Nog uh, and Rod, uh, Minotaro Nogueira, which I, you know, he's always been a great coach on that show. So I, I mean. But at the same time, those first two weeks on the show are going to be very interesting to watch because Anderson did film the first two episodes, I believe, before they had uh, asked him to come off. So starting yeah, off the show. I don't know show, if they start from scratch or they just. I don't know. Why would show. they? They've fights have already happened and such, so I don't see yeah, what, you know, I, think I don't think they can. The show, which makes sense, but... That's going to be interesting to see what they say about it come the time, especially because we may already know what's going to happen to Anderson, what his punishment will be and all this such. But in the first two episodes, we're going to see Anderson coaching. So that's going to be very interesting to see how that all plays out in the first uh, couple of uh, couple of episodes. So Yeah, we'll as for happens. the um, PD situation, I think it's just 
it's going to keep becoming a problem until the UFC steps up, does more about it, the commission to get their shit together. And they just have to realize how serious of an issue it is. If they want the sport to be taken seriously, which I hope they do, they have to get on it. That's all I can really say. Yeah. With all that being said, I mean, anything else that we haven't announced. But, uh, nope, we're going to preview UFC Fight Night 60 going down this Saturday, February 14th, Valentine's Day. So, guys, if you have cool chicks, go ahead and take them to a bar. Um, <laughs> uh, this is going to be an interesting fight card, though. I'm, I, I actually do like the main event. And I would have preferred, um, you know, the original one where we had Matt Brown and Steven Thompson or somebody, I believe. Um, but now we have, and then it was going to be Steven Thompson, Brandon Thatch, which got me even more excited because it's two up and comers, you know. But now we have Brandon Thatch versus the former UFC lightweight champion, Benson Smooth Henderson, moving up to welterweight for the first time in his career, I believe. Um, now, this is a great fight. I actually am very excited about this one. The rest of the card has a lot of uh, up and comers, uh, as I would say. I am excited about the co event because I am excited about Max Holloway. I'm a huge fan. Um, the the rest of this card looks great though. I mean a lot of a lot of uh lower weight fighters though. It's not a lot of uh there's not I don't believe there's any heavyweight fights on this card. Um I mean, middle weights as high as it goes. Just one middleweight fighter unless rest of them are lower. Well weights, featherweight, mm -hmm. lightweight, flyweights. Yeah. A lot of light, a lot of lighter weight guys on here. I mean uh yeah, with middleweight I think that might be the heaviest weight fight. Let's see. And Dan Kelly against uh, Patrick Walsh. What weight division is that? That's middleweight. Middleweight, yeah. Middleweight being the highest, I believe, yeah. Fight night. 60. Yeah, I'm excited about this one. I'm excited more so about the main event. What are your thoughts on uh, Ben Henderson uh, going up to welterweight, uh, Clark? Well, I'm not too sure about it, to be honest with you. Uh, it'll probably suit him more, to be fair. But I'm not too keen. I don't like it. He's been pretty fine at lightweight, so I think he should should have just stayed there. I'm not I'm not too keen on him moving up, to be honest. Well, I mean the reason why uh, I mean it's been on Henderson's mind even when he was the champion that he would one day move up to welterweight because he is a big guy, and that weight cut has always been a, a, an issue for him specifically. So you know he's always had he's always done it successfully. He's always, uh, which is which kudos to him because some guys you know complain about it and then sometimes they just don't get it done. But he's always been able to manage to get it done despite his complaints about it and, and everything. And so you know kudos to him for being able to do that. It will be interesting to see how he does at welterweight because of his size. He is a huge lightweight, five foot nine though. Uh, so height wise, he's not the biggest guy. Yeah. Um, I don't even know how much he walks around that, to be honest. You know, I'm, I'm he he's once sure. said that he walks around near 185, so that's heavy. To I mean, that's not huge, but he also is to get to um, 155. Pretty, that's a lot of weight. Yeah, for a no, guy's it side. is. But most of the guys at 55 walk around like 75 to 80. If he does walk around that heavy, he is he's a big dude. But I mean, he's also has low body fat, which makes the weight cut a bit harder on him. But I think he falls in that like in between category where he's Maybe a bit big for 155, but light for 170. Kind of like Diego Sanchez, yeah. Yeah, or something like a, I don't know. Uh, Nate Diaz always said he had trouble making 55, but he's too light for 70 as well. Yeah, but I mean his height kind of matches with it. if he if he you know built up more muscle, even though he never. Oh, as, yeah. as far as I understand, these dudes never look like they push weight at all. <laughs> they just work on cardio all day. Um. This will be. Yeah, I think it's interesting. If he if he winds up losing this fight, I don't think it affects him too much, and he can just drop back down. No, to especially because he's taking the fight on two weeks' notice here. Yeah, um, but if he wins, it's a big win for him. It is. Brandon Thatch is one of these up and comers that is that is uh, no joke. He he seems very exciting to watch. He did skip out on last year. He had a few uh, injuries to deal with. He's coming off a a, a terrific uh, victory against Paulo Tiago in his last fight, I believe. Um. And uh, and then before that got another quick finish over uh, wow what's his name something Edwards I'm trying to remember Justin yeah Justin Edwards uh, he's a uh, he's he's one of these up and comers that is very exciting to watch um, which is why I was most excited to see him fight Stephen Thompson because that's those are like uh, those are two very exciting up and comers that are have, have excellent striking Henderson yeah, they are, they have very similar backgrounds too 
uh, dad's dad apparently is a big like um, martial artist as is Stephen Thompson's, and they've both been doing it since they were kids. That's great. Yeah, I'm excited about this fight. Let's move on. Well, let's go down to the. Uh, we'll start from the. Oh wow, Tim Elliott versus Zach Makovsky is on this card. Now that is interesting because right. those are. I say we start there. We skip over the next two fights and then go to. The- <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I mean that fight is great. There are a lot of there are a few flyweight fights on this card, but that's got to be one of the most interesting ones to see. Zach Makovsky, former uh, Bellator bantamweight champion, versus uh, Tim Elliott. Uh, now Tim Elliott is a. Uh, um, it's one of these guys that has just kind of been a perennial contender, considering he's always been uh, in the top ten, I believe. Um, well, he's ranked eleven right now. Oh, he's ranked eleven now. Well, he yeah. might have lost. What was his last fight? Let's look it up here. Uh, Tim Elliott's last fight uh, was Joseph Benavidez, right? He got submitted. Yeah. Oh, that was a while ago. I wonder if he got injured or something. Let's see. Yeah, that was back in last April. Last April, yeah, that was a while ago. See, it was about. And he also he's on a two fight losing streak. Baggy Tinoff and Benavidez. Yeah, but I mean, look at those names, you know. <laughs> yeah, he's only lost to the top of the division. Yeah, exactly. Zach Makovsky is coming off a a uh, a, a loss as well, I believe. Let's see. Yeah, Husiar uh, Formiga. Now, Husiar is another top ranked guy, but I guess you know, with uh, with as very few guys as there are, uh, these guys in the bottom of the, uh, of the top. Uh, ranked guys in the UFC are losing to all the top five. You know what I mean? Like uh, uh, Formiga or Pickett or Ian or Lineker or Bogatinov or Dodson even or even Moraga. Moraga has also found some success taking on some of the guys trying to up and you know be up and comers as well. So it's kind of really why Flyweight has always had such an issue. I don't like that this is so far down the uh, card. It's yeah, bugging me, especially with all these guys. Say that again? I probably would have had it maybe even headlining the prelims. The prelims. Yeah, exactly. What's the, the headliner of the prelims is... Nick Lentz versus uh, Levon Makashvili. Yeah. Levon Makashvili. I love that name. That's the guy you were uh, giving us a shout-out to in the last uh, yeah. podcast. And so uh, good luck to him. Nobody likes Nick Lentz, so... <laughs> <laughs> Nick Lentz is just one of these dudes, man, who... Uh, you know, he 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 uh he seems to not talk a lot, but when he does, it's it's just annoying. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right, let's get into Makovsky. Right well, now. I think Makovsky is one of these wrestlers, man. That's uh that's got such a great grappling style, grappling background, especially. Uh, he's hung in there with guys like Joe Warren before, and uh and um you know he had great success in uh. In, in, in Bellator, plus you know, even in grappling, he's he's very well known. He's won uh you know he's won many uh renowned championships in grappling, uh, such as the uh you know the Fort Lauderdale grap- uh, men's grappling world championships. The uh, uh, he won gold in that in that uh, tournament. He's also won gold and 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 uh, medaled in other competitions in just men's grappling before. So he's a he's he's uh you know. He's a force to mess with on the ground. I feel like on against the cage as well. He's going to be dangerous, especially for a guy like Tim Elliott. Tim Elliott uh, has to come to grapplers, of course, in the past. Uh, but Tim Elliott, he definitely has a wild style in striking. He's very high paced. He's got great cardio, from what I can see. Um, and uh, so, I mean, if if he can just create a pace to where Mikasi can't match, I feel like Elliott could possibly out cardio the guy. Um, you know, especially if he's able to, you know, put uh, implement a high volume pace where he's landing a lot, getting away from the the grappling, uh, staying, keep it standing, make Makovsky come forward, make him work, tire him out. Uh, I feel like he could definitely find a decision or a late finish here. Um, Daniel, what do you think? I like Makovsky. Uh, probably, probably by decision. Uh, I don't think. I think he's a battle of uh, gatekeepers, to be honest. <laughs> Pal Hugo, what do you think? Yeah, I think um one of these guys, the winner of this fight, could be on the come up. I feel like um Elliot, if he wins, not as much so because he is on the two fight losing streak, even though it's to two of the top guys in the division. But Makovsky's only loss in the UFC has been to um Husia Formiga. He was two and zero, and he beat Jorgensen Sampo, which are solid wins. And I, I feel like he's just a guy who. He has a shot at at least building himself up a little bit more, just because it, that's his only loss. It was. It's not like he got completely dominated by Formiga, and he Formiga is also a guy who's in the top five of the division. So I feel like Makovsky is going to be able to take Elliott down, 
um, work from the top a lot. I feel like there's going to be a lot of scrambles in this fight, and I think Mikovsky's wrestling will probably get it done for him here. Yeah, I mean, while I while I broke it down and in, in, in saying why Tim Elliott can win, you guys told me to, are explaining why Zach can win, and I kind of am on your side there. I do feel like Zach Mikovsky's grappling will be too much. I've just kind of stated what it takes for Tim to win, and I think that that's it. He's got to really avoid the grappling of this uh, of Mikovsky uh, to win this fight. He's got to keep it standing. He's got to keep it high paced. Um, and he seems really good at that. I mean, he can take a punch too, Kenny Elliott. So I, I believe that no matter what McCoskey does throw at him on the feet, he'll be able to um, stay alive in there throughout the all three rounds. So yeah, I do see McCoskey winning this uh, one, three, uh, three rounds in. Uh, with that, we'll move on. I actually am interested in uh, yeah. Rodrigo De Lima versus Efron Escudero. Uh, before before we get to that, I also just want to mention that Mikulski's never been finished by knockout or TKO, so that also played into his favor. Yeah. So this would be a very tough fight to see a finish, but it, it, it could also end up being an exciting fight, especially because of the way flyweights fight. They're always exciting. So um, if their finish does happen, it, it would be surprising, though I would see it coming from uh, Tim Elliott's end more so than Zach's. Yeah. That being okay. said. Moving on. Moving on, yeah, Rodrigo De Lima versus Efron Escudero. I actually am, I'm actually interested in this fight only because I used to be an Escudero fan, and then he kind of fell off the map, and now he's come back. Um, I am interested in seeing how he does. Uh, he had a, he's had a fight re re when he returned to the UFC, but I don't recall it right now. Uh, uh, Leonardo uh, Santos at the Bigfoot Arlovsky fight. That's it, and that's the reason being is because I only watched the main card of that fight. Um, now. He's coming off a loss after returning to the UFC. Um, so this is very uh, interesting to see where it goes. Rodrigo de Lima um, also has just one fight, I believe, in the UFC, which is a win. Uh, so it's a big fight for uh, de Lima, Efrain, I, for both guys. They really need a win here. Um, Efrain, if he wants to stay in the UFC any longer, the Ultimate Fighter 9 winner here, um, then he certainly needs a win. Now, I, I haven't seen where either men have come back, but being a fan of Efrain from back in the day, his striking always looks solid, though I don't feel like it ever evolved. I don't feel like he ever uh, put uh, learned how to be more explosive. I also don't feel like he, he was ever too uh, too fast. I don't feel like his footwork was ever there. I think he, there was always a lot of room for improvement for him where he was already decent. But, you know, that the competition nowadays is, has, has certainly caught up. And, uh, and he needs to, too. So uh, it's definitely an interesting fight. I just wanted to put that out there that I, I would like to see where uh, Escudero can go from here. And I'd like to see him get the win. Uh, Rodrigo de Lima, one of these uh, Brazilian guys that is uh, that is very uh, well-versed in Muay Thai, um, as well as having a, a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, brown belt, very dangerous. So, no, Chris, he doesn't have a black belt, I know. But... <laughs> But um, uh, that's just I, I I just wanted to shine my two cents on that. Being a fan of Escudero, I'd like to see how it goes. We will move on now to the uh, main event of the prelims, as you would say. Nick Lance versus Levon. Uh, did I say that right? Levon Max Chavelli. Max uh, Chavelli. Uh, yeah, sure. please comment on that one. You know more about your boy than I do. So. All right. So the real place I'm worried about for Levon is just in by getting a grapple f by Nick Lance. That's where I'm really just worried about him. Because um, Nick Lentz is he's a solid wrestler. He Unless he's facing another wrestler, he's usually able to get the fight to the mat, especially since moving to 45. And I'm pretty sure his only loss at 45 has been to Chad Mendes since moving down. So if Levon's able to keep the fight on the feet, if he's able to keep Lentz off him, I think he wins his fight. But that's if he can keep it on the feet, which... I don't know. I like. I want to say he can. He he's he has good wrestling. He has good defensive wrestling, and he has good offensive wrestling. But I'm not sure if it's better than Lentz's. And I also think he's going to be the smaller guy going in there because Lentz is a pretty big guy for 145. So I'm not entirely sure if he can keep Lentz off him for three rounds. But I'm hoping he can. If he can keep it on the feet, I could see him winning this fight for sure. I'm not. I gotta go with Levon. I gotta go with Levon just because. He's my boy. He trains. He comes over to the gym every once in a while. So I got to go with Levon, but I think it's a, there's a good chance of Lentz winning this fight by decision. Lame. <laughs> Daniel, any uh, thoughts on this fight at all? Uh, I just think Lentz decision all day long. 
<laughs> All day long. It's as simple as that. Simple. All right, we'll move on to the main card. Ray Borg versus Chris Kalat Kalatis. I would. Kalatis. Uh, Kalatis. We'll go with that one. <laughs> uh, Ray Borg. This is another exciting flyweight fight. Ray Borg is a guy, is one of these guys that has a uh, has has um good finishing power at at, at that weight division and a division obviously very uh, short of of that kind of talent. Um. One and one right now. Uh, he did get a, a submission victory in his last fight uh, against Shane Howell. Uh, that was a great fight. I remember watching that. It was a great performance. He was not only uh, winning that fight um, on the ground, of course, but he he, he looked solid standing. Um, went toe to toe with Dustin Ortiz all three rounds. Made it close. Uh, before then, he was undefeated in the UFC, or I mean, undefeated in MMA, six and zero. So. Uh, and on all of them finish or all but one of them finishes. So uh, he, he's he's one of these guys that it's definitely uh, got to keep an eye out on this guy because he, he he comes around to finish fights. Um, Dustin Ortiz obviously not an easy guy to finish, so you can see why that went to the decision. But he's an exciting dude to watch from what I've seen of uh, of his fights in the uh, UFC thus far. I'm excited to see how he does. He's fighting um, Chris Kalades. Now, I don't know much about this guy, um, but just looking at his uh, UFC record, he seems to have a, a decent striking rate. So he's fighting another striker here, um, in which case this would be very interesting uh, to see um, what Chris can bring to the table that uh, that fans are obviously unaware of to see uh, of seeing much of his fights. I don't know where he's fought before. Um, but with that being said, I got to go with Ray Borg here. He's uh he's he seems like a very dangerous fighter for flyweight. To have only two of nine fights in 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 uh in your MMA career as a flyweight all be finishes, that's very impressive to me. So with that being said, I got to go with Ray Borg. Uh, probably finishes this fight in the second round. Uh, Daniel, what do you think? Uh, exactly the same as you. Submission, second round, Ray Borg. Oh, submission. All right. What about you, Chris? All right. So I'm. One thing I'm curious about before I actually get into what I think is going to happen in this fight is why this fight is the opener for the main card and the McCloskey um, Elliott fight is the opener. No for the respect, Rainbow. son. The flyweight just, division they, just gets no respect. Yeah, they're both flyweights. Yeah, but probably because Ray Borg is a more exciting fighter, I would think. Yeah, and um, so as for Kaladis, I don't really know much about him. He did come into the UFC and beat Patrick Houlihan, which. I remember watching that fight. It's a pretty impressive win for him. And because um, it's Hulahan, you know, these Irish fighters have certainly become uh, names to watch. I remember Hulahan yeah. won a, an exciting victory in the first I Ireland card. Yeah, and he um, recently won on the um, Boston card. Yeah. So he's been pretty good in his loss. He did lose to Kalidis, even though that's really all I know about the guy. And then um, for Ray Borg, he's looked. Excellent. His only loss in his career was a split decision to Dustin Ortiz, who's one of the top guys in the division. So, um, I'm going to have to go with Boric. He seems to like those second round submissions, so I'm going to agree with you guys. Give it to him by submission. Uh, I think TKO, but we'll go with submission. Yeah, I, I, I see this fight because of Chris being the fighter that it says that he is here, being a, a well known or being well known for his striking. I would think that this is maybe stay on the feet unless Borg decides to take it to the ground himself. Um, yeah. But I'd like to see how Borg does standing with another striker, and maybe he might, you know, uh, be the better striker. So uh, that's just me. Yeah. Um, and Borg's one of those alliance guys, so I gotta love the alliance. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. What we'll move on to the next one. Um, Mike, I want to say Michael, but Michael Prezeras versus yeah. Kevin Lee. Now I know Kevin Lee. I do not know about Michael Prezeras. Um, Kevin Lee being a, uh, you know, certainly a. Uh, a, a newbie in the UFC thus far. He's only two and one. Um, coming off a, a victory over John Tuck. Now John Tuck is a uh, is a is a big win. I feel because John is one of these up and comers that has a has a, had a big following. His only loss being the Ally and Quinta, I believe. Right? Am I wrong? Yes. I gotta look this up. Let's see. Yeah, he lost to Al. John Tuck, Jesse Rose. Yep, lost to Ally and Quinta in his debut at UFC 169. He hooked and then he lost to the one of losing the decision. Oh uh, wow! Yeah, I uh, I remember that fight. Um, UFC 169 last last year in February. So now he's he's been around a year. He's gotten some time to get some uh, momentum going. We'll look at Michael Prezeras because I honestly don't know anything about him. He's a Brazilian fighter. Um, Prezeras he recently is coming off a win over uh, Maribek Tysimov, and he lost to Paulo Thiago back in 2013. He hasn't fought in about a year, so that could hurt him. 
could hurt him. We'll see. I mean, I know more about Kevin Lee. Being able to hang in there with Ally uh, Quint of three rounds is impressive. Um, yeah, also they have a mutual opponent in Jesse Ronson, who they both beat by split decision. <laughs> well, this should be interesting. This is a very close matchup, I, I feel. Let's see what, what it is that uh, Michael is based, more known for here. Uh, Jiu Jitsu has team. eight submission wins, nine decision, and one knockout win. Yeah. And um, Kevin Lee's a wrestler. I think wow. in this fight, I think Lee can control the pace of the fight where it goes on the feet. I think he's a little bit better. And then this he is, can take the fight down. So. This is very interesting. Prezeres has been – how old is he? He's 31. But it says he's been fighting since 2000. So, so that's 15. So he's been fighting since he was 16, 16 years old. Yeah. He fought at 16 and got a win uh, in, in a Valley Tudo promotion and then fought and then didn't fight for three years later when he was 19 and then started his career from there. Got three wins in 03, a win in 04, a one win in 05. So then he was like steadily fighting, like barely, yeah, like once or twice has a year. The experience, yeah. yeah, but it's kind of weird how, you know, his fights are kind of very stretched out. Like he'd fight. Yeah. Like, he fought once in 04, once in 05, twice in 06, but then fight, fought four times in 07, yeah, one time I mean, in 08, and didn't fight in 09, fought one time in 2010. And has been the year, so, yeah, that, that is a little odd, but um, he, he like, has the experience <laughs> over uh, Kevin Lee, who's only been fighting since 2012. Yeah, that's true, but it's very odd that, you know, for a guy who's been fighting since he was 16, that he would spread all of his fights out like that. I mean, maybe it's healthier for him, but. It seems that the gym he trains at is his own, so I, I would think, you know, if it's his own gym, he's got a lot to offer as an instructor. Um, so maybe his jiu-jitsu game is... I'm going assume he's a black belt in Brazilian. <laughs> <laughs> for, for Clark, who may not get it, Clark, uh, we had a, a funny joke going on in the show where... Um, Chris Paliuka just assumed that every Brazilian that ever fights in the UFC is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. <laughs> I said John Lineker was a black belt. He turned out to be a blue belt, but <laughs> I, I, I just assumed. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, he tried to he tried to make you seem smart. I remember in that fight with McCall, he, was, he almost got him in a guillotine choke. That fight was crazy. <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, just going back to the Lee Prezeras fight, I'm going to pick Kevin Lee by decision. Just go ahead. I think I'll go with Prezeras. I got to think that a guy who's been around for – in the, who's even been involved in the sport for that long uh, has something to, to offer that we haven't seen, that we haven't seen or that we have seen but not in a very long time. So I'm, yeah. I'm going to go with Prezeras. I think he might get a pull out of submission here. Yeah, um, it's possible. I just think Lee is a solid up-and-comer, and I think – He'll get the win. Yeah, a guy who has his own gym has something to offer, and I would think at this point in his career Jeez. facing somebody. Yeah, well, yeah, I like the. I, I feel like he may come out looking uh very savvy on the ground, and I believe that he'll he'll have a, a lot to offer that we don't see too much from guys uh around that level of the game right now. Daniel, what do you think? I'm going with the young gun, Kevin Lee. The young gun. He takes it by probably split decision. All right then, Dan. Kevin better be working that guard. All right, we'll see. <laughs> I got Prezeris. We'll see how it goes. I'm going to call you back on this one, Pag. All right. Dan Kelly versus Patrick Walsh, the heaviest fight on the card at middleweight. Uh, I'm I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Daniel start this one off, see what he thinks. I, I know that the Dan Kelly is a you know, is an Australian guy. I know you're not Australian, but I just wanted to see what your thoughts are on a guy who's thus far finished every fight. Other than one in his uh, career thus far, he was nine and zero, or eight and zero. I'm sorry. It's, it seems like his submissions more than anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't know too much about either guy. I've got to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, yeah. It's a tough one. He's actually competed yeah. in the Olympics in yeah, judo he's, he's since guy. 2000. Yeah. That is crazy. Yeah, he's an old dude too. Yeah, he did much better in the 2000 games where he competed in judo, got ninth place. <laughs> Weren't, um, these guys were both on the Ultimate Fighter. Well, uh, Kelly, I think, was on the Smashes season, and then Patrick Walsh was on uh, Joan Sun, maybe? No, uh, oh, yeah. what is it? Um, yeah, Kelly, Canada versus Australia. Yeah. yeah. But where was uh, Walsh on? I think he was Smashes. No, I think Walsh was... Um, 
I think Walsh was on uh, Jones for Sunday or one of those seasons. No, no, I, I, I believe. Oh, well, maybe. I don't know. Let's see. Because he's from the U.S. Is he? Maybe then. Yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, I got to... Uh, I don't know. I would love to see uh, a, another judo guy come up to form here, but uh, you know, he's certainly got to be able to mix in a lot of other, uh, you know, decent styles to to mix in with judo. Because judo by itself is already hard enough to do in MMA as it is. Um, you know, uh, uh, guys like uh, oh, what's his name? There's that guy in Bellator, and I can't remember, or he was in Bellator. He's not in, Rick Hans. Who uh you know uh, who came in with with powerful boxing and then u- utilized it to set up great uh, judo and Rick Hans is one of those guys and I would think that he also need to be he's undefeated so you know d- despite his his lack of success in the Olympics even though he's constantly tried which kudos to him um to to, to be undefeated right now uh at eight and zero is impressive in itself uh especially with all but all but one being a finish um. It's definitely gonna be interesting. So I I would like to see him go in there and and utilize that judo again. And I feel like with all these main submissions, he he's really savvy on the ground. I think he'll be able to find a way to get it to the, the to the ground and maybe get a late late finish in the third round. I'd say. All right, sorry to interrupt, but uh, Patrick Walsh is from season nineteen of The Ultimate Fighter, which explains why no one remembers it because that season was pretty horrible. Which season was that? Which, oh, that was Frankie Edgar, uh, BJ Penn, yeah. correct? Yeah. So, um, as I remember watching, uh, Walsh is a pretty good striker. He's decent on the feet. He's nothing really that special. And um, as for Kelly on smashes, he's a good grappler. I know he's a bit older and he has uh, some injury problems, but I, I could definitely see him getting so. Uh, actually, just looking at his shirt dog, I have to mention this. His first win was by TKO, and the result is thrown from the ring. What the? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Dan Kelly or Patrick Wall? Dan Kelly. Wait, wait, wait a minute. We're... I gotta look up YouTube to see if that's there. TKO thrown from the ring. <laughs> Just wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. Have you seen, have you seen Ross that? Dallow. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. We're gonna look this up. And if that is the case. If you're watching this on YouTube, fight fans, I will add the video of this to the YouTube <laughs> if I can find it. Let's see if I can find it. What's Dan Kelly and what, give me his name again, the opponent? Ross Dallow. Dan. Have you seen the time? Uh, 2006, and then they didn't have another fight till 2012. Yeah. It's a bit weird. Thrown just... from the ring. That must be the most <laughs> legit looking judo throw you'll ever see in your life. Dan yeah, I don't know. Well, Ross, I what? Know. Uh, Ross Dallow, D A L L O W. All right. Let's see. All right. Just just going based off their records and what I know about the guys, I'm gonna go with uh, Dan Kelly by submission. Let's see. Let's see. Dan Kelly. Oh my goodness, that would be <laughs> incredible. <laughs> uh, Ross Dallow. Uh, can't see it anywhere. Um, Apparently he fought Dylan Andrews. No, I'm not finding I, it. If I do find it, and if I do find it, it will be added to the page. It will, it will be uh, it will be key mark, and uh, we will find it. If I can, I will add it to the YouTube version of the podcast for anybody that wants to see that. That's um, a real shame that you can't find that. Well, I mean, I'm looking for it right now out of the Very blue. Very unfortunate. Fudge, yeah. Yeah, I'm going Dan Kelly, rear naked choke. I'm good. I'll go with the, I'll go with uh, an, uh, probably an arm bar uh, round three. Dan, I'll go late round two. All right. Then. <laughs> Dan <laughs> Kill. He certainly won himself some props by throwing a dude out of the. <laughs> we'll move on to the next far, uh, fight. Uh, Ki- Kichi Kunimoto versus uh, Neil Magny. Now Neil Magny had one hell of a 2014, uh, winning five straight fights. Uh, I believe three of them were finishes. I could be wrong. Um, but that is impressive in itself. Uh, and, and I actually am particularly interested in seeing how much farther he can go. Kunimoto, uh, that's a guy that fought Eric Silva last year, correct? No. Who did he fight? 
Um, he has a win over Daniel Serafian, a split decision. Over oh, I remember that match. fight. I do remember that fight. Yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. That was a great. He's the yeah. guy with the blonde hair. Oh, okay. Yeah. That guy is very fun to watch. He's certainly a tough dude too, because he took a lot of Daniel's uh, toughest shots and then was able to, uh, you know, hang in there with him. Got it to the ground, found the choke. Uh, good comeback fight, I remember, in one round. Uh, he actually lost to the guy who lost to Eric Silva. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. This is uh, so two and zero in the US, our three and zero. Um, this is a very interesting fight. I like this fight actually. Then no, knowing who he is and, and his fighting style uh, for Neil Magna, that's a tough test. That's a tougher test than 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 what's kind of been thrown his way uh, all of last year. Regardless, five fights in one year is impressive, no matter how you slice it. Um, to be able to especially train that long, yeah, to, especially to win them all, regardless of just fighting them. But to go five and zero to train to, to cut weight to do all that such five times in one year is is a, is a heavy order. Uh, he was able to do that successfully. Had a terrific 014 something that he can 014 <laughs>2014 sorry. Um, I, I like this fight. I think that Neil Magny has a lot to prove. Uh, and and and, is, and, it, and certainly if he wins this fight, it's time he can really start. Asking to to get more on the pecking order of of of, of contenders or, or ranked opponents moving forward, especially. So um, with that, I actually want I actually got Kunimoto winning this one. I think that his uh, grappling is is going to be tough for Magny to deal with. Should he be able to get it to the ground? Um, uh, he certainly uh, he certainly looked more impressive in his fights. Uh, on the ground than Magni ever has in all of those five wins in the last year. So I, I feel like Kunimoto pulls off the upset, gets the win uh, on the ground. Uh, if not by finish, then probably t takes it to a decision. Dan, what are your thoughts? Let's... I think Kunimoto takes it first round. I think he just comes out. Literates Magni. High, high calls. Chris, what do you got? All right. Um, just talking about Neil Magni, I'm really – I've been impressed by him. He was one and two in the UFC – after um he had a win over John Manley and then lost twice in 2013 and then he 2014 was his year he beat some impressive guys too I mean he had a a win over Alex Garcia who was a big up and comer Tim Means is no slouch so I I think he's gonna come out I think he's just gonna he's looked improved in the on the feet too if no one's noticed that really he has been improved on the feet but I think he's gonna be able to take Kunimoto down hold him there for a good amount of the fight and take a decision as well. All right, cool deal. I like this fight. This is gonna be. A, I think this will be end up being an exciting fight. I really do. We'll move on to the co-main event, which is if not next to the main event, the fight I'm most excited to see: Cole Miller versus Max Holloway. Now I'm excited to see Cole Miller come back. Uh, I've always been a fan of his, but Max Holloway has made me an even bigger fan of his. He also had a terrific 2014, winning four fights all by finishes um, last year. Uh, a very heavy load to, to take, especially for a kid his age, but he came through with it, won all four fights, finished all four fights, and has seemingly improved so much in the stand-up. I love it. Um, and I believe that he'll he'll be a, 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 a very terrible matchup for Miller in the stand-up. Though Cole has shown at times, not not consecutively or, or you know, really kept a, a – um, consistent pace with this has shown dangerous striking before in the past but i believe that max is is more dangerous standing though holloway is susceptible to guys on the ground um while he's improved slightly since his days uh in, in his first year like when he first fought Poirier, making his debut and such um and he uh he though i don't agree with it i i dennis bermuda's holloway fight i did believe dennis kind of lost that fight uh, and, but, but if there was any arguing point, it was because that Dennis was able to take it to the ground and control him from there. So with that being said, I believe that Holloway is susceptible to the ground and who and Cole Miller is obviously one of the most dangerous guys in that division on the ground. So I got to go with uh, Cole Miller winning this fight probably by second round submission, though I am hoping that Max Holloway can get the win. Chris, what do you got? Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you. I think Cole Miller is going to be able to use scrappling here. And uh, Holloway has had trouble with uh, keeping the fight off the mat. Dustin Poirier got him down and submitted him in the past. He has looked really good, though. I mean, after the McGregor loss, he went 4-0 in 2014. He has some wins over some really good guys, and he's finished all of those guys. And I think if he's able to keep the fight on the feet, he has the advantage. But 
I'm not sure if he'll be able to. Cole Miller isn't like a wrestler. He's a jiu-jitsu guy. He's not like one of these wrestlers who'll be able to take um, Holloway down as easily as uh, Dennis was able to. But I think if he gets it down, Holloway might be in some trouble. It's a really close fight either way you slice it because it just depends on really on Holloway's um, takedown defense in my opinions. But I think I'll have to go with Cole Miller. Um, maybe by submission or decision not too sure on that but i think i think it could go either way got you mr clark who do you got uh it's just, it, it is a tough one i like holloway a lot I, th- I think he's a a little bit better than cole miller but it's one of them where it's uh it's tough i don't think i don't think holloway can finish him and i think he needs to finish to beat miller so for that reason i'm gonna go i'm gonna have to go for cole miller decision yeah, it's 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 not. More, I know a lot of fans would probably disagree with this, and for good reason, because Max has got a lot of momentum on his side. Miller hasn't fought in a while. Um, it just seems that you know his his weakness is very susceptible to Miller's best strengths. You know what I mean? Um, if Max can keep this standing, and if he can uh, out, if he can out, uh, you know, outstrike Miller, then of course he wins. You know, and and I believe that he can do that. It just seems more. It seems more. Um, likely that Miller can somehow get this to the ground and, and get the submission. If Max can keep it standing, which I believe he can, then he will get the win for sure. I believe he's a more dangerous striker. Um, so with that being said, I, I hope Max can do that. I hope he can implement that plan. It just seems more likely Miller wins, and I feel like that. that's why we all agree that he will probably get the victory. Uh, that being all said, we move on to the main event. Brandon Thatch versus Benson Smooth Henderson. Now this is an extraordinarily interesting fight. I'm intrigued because, you know, Henderson has always looked um, top level at lightweight. I, I can't deny that. Um, he's he, what, what I feel like he's always lacked is explosive power and striking, in which case Thatch has that. He's very he explosive. Bunch of that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you talking about Thatch, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, certainly does. That's, that's a scary dude. Yeah, I mean, he seems to be, uh, you know, very unpredictable, wily. He seems uh, – he's very uh, – He's certainly ballsy when he go when it for for what he throws, but he's successful with it, so it, it makes sense that he does you know attack the way that he does. Um, with that being said, uh, Henderson has a lot of experience. I'm sure his grappling will come into play here, and we've never really seen Thatch be threatened on the ground. We've not seen how he looks on his back um, too much, so it, it'll be very interesting. We don't know too much about Brandon Thatch, no matter how excited we are about him. We know he's very dangerous on the feet and he can finish fights for sure. Benson Henderson um, is, a, is at a very weird spot right now, losing two fights straight, regardless of how you judge the last fight. Um, it's very interesting. I think Henderson, his size being 5'9", Brandon Thatch is a much larger man, correct? Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, he's 6'2". 6'2". This is going to be a very, very big height difference. <laughs> Yeah, five yeah. nine? Wait, okay. Five inches. That's five inch. Uh, God, I can only imagine the reach disadvantage as well. Yeah, I'm gonna um, look that up real quick. I'm sure it's huge, Henderson, but Henderson's got. I'm pretty sure he's got a pretty big reach. Like he does have a good reach. He's a lo- he's got wide range in his legs and, and, and arms for sure. Brandon Thatch's reach on Wikipedia seventy four point five inches. And other and then Sure Dog says he has like an eighty reach. reach Tapology says seventy four point five two. Okay, cool. I'll we'll go with that. <laughs> and then this is for Thatch or Brandon or Benson. Brandon Thatch. Brandon. Oh, okay. Seventy four and a half inch reach, and then Benson. I'll look up. Yeah. Well, I believe Benson has a seventy four as well. I could. Benson be Henderson's reach on Wikipedia seventy inches. ESPN seventy inches. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, he's got so certainly got the reach. Well, then that just shows you that Henderson's got a lot to worry about on the stand-up. Um, doesn't mean he can't get on the inside. A lot of guys are good at it, um, but it's yeah. got to be it's, it's got to be up to Thatch to be able to utilize his distance correctly, um, and uh, and Benson to be able to close the distance as well as I really would love it if he utilized the uh, leg kicks more. I mean, in his last fight with Cerrone, he was utilizing them really well, but he's got powerful kicks as well. So I feel like he needs to throw some more to the body. Um, and, uh, and and really mixed up with his kicks for as powerful as his legs are. I know he uses them more so for explosiveness in his wrestling and his takedowns. Um, but I, I mean, I really should you know mix up his kickboxing more. And I, and I, and I think that he'd be able to hold his own standing with him if he if he trained for that in this fight. Though of course, not a lot of room to train for this fight, so we might not see that. 
So I think that that uh, holds holds a very uh, high advantage in the striking, and I think Henderson holds a, a holds a, a strong advantage in the grappling because we've not seen much of that from Thatch, and uh, we've not seen how he is defensively on his back. And this is a five round fight, so remember that. And and Henderson's of course more experienced in five round fights. I believe this is Brandon Thatch's first. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of key points here uh, that 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 are in the corner of both fighters. You know what I mean? So. Thatch, of course, being the bigger guy, doesn't mean he's the stronger man. Doesn't mean that he'll be able to uh, implement uh, his the, the space like he'd want to, and like say against the cage where Benson would look for a takedown or for strikes. Um, although, of course, he has looked dangerous there as well. So, I mean, he, uh, Benson would still need to be careful there. This is such a hard fight to call now that we're really breaking it down. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, off the top of my head, I would have to say. Uh, Probably, probably Henderson by decision, five rounds. I feel like he'd be able to hang in there, uh, but at the same time, he did get dropped by Rafael dos Santos with one punch. One punch can change the course of a yeah, fight you like never that, know how it's and you never know. Him. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> Such a tough one. Is that you pick Ben decision? Ben, I'll go with Final Benson action. Henderson by decision, though I, I I believe that Thatch will certainly make this a very close fight. Final answer. Final answer. Bug it. All right, so. When you look at Brandon Thatch's record, you see one loss, which was a split decision in his second pro fight ever in 2008, and then you see round one, knockout, round one, knockout, round one, knockout, round one, knockout, and you see that the whole way through, round one, knockout, round one, you see a few submissions sprinkled in there, but this guy is scary. The longest he's been in a fight outside of that decision was four minutes and 12 seconds. Well, shit. Where does so, he train? Let's look that up. Um, he's from Colorado. I'm oh, sure. that's correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've been training so much. Yeah. Grudge. So, yeah. Okay. You may not believe me, but I, now I remember why. Uh, why my dad is on. So I mean, my dad lives in Colorado, and he's actually trained boxing at the Grudge Training Center. Um, and so now I know. Uh, uh my dad will actually be be at this event. Lucky. Um. <laughs> so uh and and uh I, I know he talks to me about training there and uh, he, he i remember uh, a few weeks back when he was coming over to visit we were talking about this guy and uh he was explaining how his boxing seems to be one of the most impressive in the gym so now i, I completely forgot about that conversation but um it's all coming back to me now yeah uh, i was um listening to the fighter and the kid the podcast with uh brendan job and Brian Callen, because Shaw's trained over there at Grudge, yes. and he, he just talked about how good Brandon Thatch's striking is, how he could be a champion one day, and he thinks he'll be a champion within a year and a half, so this guy's impressive. This guy is one of the hottest prospects in MMA, and he beat Chidi Ninjukawani by TKO in 53 seconds, so, <laughs> what? I mean... This guy is scary, and he's a lot bigger than Benson. I think if he's able to utilize his reach, which I think he'll be able to do, mm -hmm. he, he can finish Benson in the first round. I think it's definitely possible. For Benson, he's a smaller guy, but he's also going to be quicker. And I'm pretty sure since uh, Thatch has never been past the first round, aside from that one fight, I think Benson's going to have the advantage in cardio, and I think because he's been in so many five-round fights, mm -hmm. he's going to have to get on the inside of Thatch because he's a lot smaller, and he's going to have to look for those takedowns and just try to wear him out as much as possible, try to get it to where he's not going to be able to land that knockout strike later in the fight. So he'll have a bit of an advantage there. Yeah, but I see a that, lot of early cage fighting coming from Benson moving, uh, starting the fight off. Yeah, he probably try to get him against the cage, get in. He has to get inside somehow and just take this guy down. And also, Thatch hasn't like I, the guy hasn't taken a lot of damage just because of how quick all of his fights have been he has more fights i'm pretty sure that have ended under a minute than over a minute damn that's disturbing that's, that's disturbing, disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, he, his last four fights have lasted two minutes 10 seconds a minute 23 222 and 155 then before that he won 18 seconds 15 seconds 53 19 18 38 this, this is, is going to be a very interesting main event. Yeah. I'm More really so than I had uh, envisioned before we even did this podcast, which is why I love doing this podcast because we always get to break it down and I get to bounce my thoughts and then you guys bring in a new uh, 
perspectives on it, and it makes it a very yeah. interesting fight. I mean, as long as Thatch is able to keep Ben away from him where he can't get that takedown, I think he has a really good shot of ending this fight early. He's a scary guy on the 50. He might be one of the most dangerous strikers in MMA right now. So I, I'm going to go with Thatch by knockout in the first round, maybe the second. But I'm feeling kind of confident in that. I mean, I could definitely see Benson if he's able to get him down for the first couple rounds and wear him out, winning the fight by decision. But I'm going to go with that. I, Daniel, before we go to you, I will say this. It really does break my heart more so now that Steven Thompson isn't taking this fight. Because, man, that oh, would have been... be an outstanding strike. Oh, man. I, no matter how this fight ends for Thatch, I want to see him fight Thompson at some point in the future. Especially with Thompson being on a five-fight win streak. The momentum is yeah. on both men's side at this point. Especially if he beats Benson. That would be his third fight, uh, third win. is easily his biggest win. Uh, and these guys could still easily headline a card. So I would still like to see Thatch fight Thompson uh, sometime in the near future if Thompson can get a uh, uh, healthy quick uh, yeah, they're both very after. similar. They have different striking styles, but they're both they both came up striking. They both aren't the best grapplers. They're very similar, and that would be an outstanding match to watch how that would play out on the beat. All right, Daniel, close this out. How do you see this fight going, this main event? Uh, basically, I don't think it's going to go to decision. I think it ends in the fourth round by Ben Anderson submission. By submission? Wow. Where do you see that coming from? I, I just think where Fatch down. Fatch has to get the finish within the first two rounds. If you don't get that, it is Bendo's just going to wear him down, wear him down, get to round three, round four. I think submission is going to come. All right, good call though. That might that's that's very possible, definitely. Um, yeah, submission is definitely possible for Ben because we haven't seen much of Thatch's grappling, so. Well, what I like about the MMA lab is that they've improved their uh, their jiu-jitsu training. They brought in um, a guy named uh, Rafael Dalla, Dalla Fiema, who's a who's like this 48-year-old Brazilian jiu-jitsu expert. Uh, Rick Story talks about him a lot in interviews, uh, saying that he's helped him a lot uh, with his top game. Uh, being that you know he's where like Rick Story recently uh, got a submission victory, uh, not over. Gunnar Nelson, but in a fight before that, I forget who the opponent was, but he said that tra just a few weeks of training with that guy really taught him a lot. Um, so the MMA lab certainly has a, a jiu-jitsu expert really running things a lot better than before. So you never know. I mean, Henderson could be learning a, a, a lot of, uh, 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 pardon the pun, smooth uh, moves out there uh, at the MMA lab. It's very yeah, possible. This, fight, this fight's just really so interesting because it can go any way. It could end... By a submission by Ben Anderson would it be surprising? A knockout by that would it be surprising? A decision for Anderson would it be surprising? So it just shows how closely matched and contested both of these guys are, especially where, yeah. because of how where at, in their careers they're at. Ben being a very veteranized fighter at this point, that being one of the most exciting up and comers that we have in the sport thus far. So man, definitely excited. This is gonna be a great card. I actually am more excited now for it uh, now than uh, I was before. Certainly. Especially because, you know, with all the bad news that's been going around, dumbing down the news of fights, you forget that there are fights, and these fights are going to be exciting. And yeah, I, uh, it's really, there's only a handful of fights on this card I'm really excited for. For the most part, I'm not too excited, but that Henderson fight, I think, I, I'm really excited about that one. I'm also excited to see the Levon fight, but yeah, I think this will be a fun card. Same here. Daniel, yeah. any last thoughts on this fight card? I just want to know what... what What's your pick for fight of the night? Ooh. Can you even pick one? Hmm. I think I'm gonna go with Ray Borg and Chris Kalades. Uh, I think uh, both men being strikers. I think it's gonna be a very tough uh, fight for both men, uh, especially both coming up uh, up and comers. They both got a lot to prove. Guys like that always bring it. Uh, to the nth degree, uh, especially against each other, I think it'll make for an exciting fight. Although it could also make for a quick fight, which then would kind of take away <laughs> the uh, fight of the night. But it could also get performance of the night. So it's either between that or the main event for me. Yeah, I was thinking it's possible for Mikovsky Elliott, but I also think Mikovsky uh, is going to do a lot of wrestling. So I'm going to go with Holloway Miller. That's not a bad pick. What about you, Clark? No, because I think there's going to be a lot of scrambles in that fight too. Yeah. Clark, what about you? I like Skelly versus Ailis early on, February 5th. I think that might be a surprise package. 
Right. Jim Ellis versus Chaz Kelly. Yeah. We skipped over that fight because yes, I did. really don't know much about it. I don't know much about him either. Do you, Clark? Because if you do, please enlighten no, us. No, no, a great deal. I'm just, just think they're both gamers, basically. We'll just go for it from there. All Hopefully. right, then. Yeah, this is definitely going to be an exciting card fight. Fight fans, it's going down this Saturday, February 14th. If you're single, it, you should definitely watch this fight. <laughs> um, it's going to be a great fight card. I'm excited. Uh, you should be, too. With everything going on, it, yeah. it, it's good to finally get a fight card coming along to get us back excited and to show us why we're excited about the sport. So I hope this card delivers. Uh, Guys, we all know we all know Valentine's Day isn't a real holiday. Just go watch the fights. What he said. Be okay. <laughs> I love my girl, but she's going to watch these fights with me. She better. You know. <laughs> <laughs> if she loves me, it's a, it, I feel it should be a good trade-off. <laughs> This is going to be a great fight card, fans. Watch it. Please, if you uh, haven't already, please subscribe on iTunes uh, or Stitcher app. If, uh, you know, like I said earlier, saving data on your phone is a, a – storage data on your phone is a, is a hassle right now. Get the Stitcher app. It's only like a couple megabytes. You'll be fine. And it, uh, hey, guys. Make sure to rate and review the podcast as well on Stitcher and iTunes just because it helps out a lot. It gets the podcast a little bit noticed a little bit more. And, yes. uh, yeah, we're looking to grow this year, so – my Help Twitter handle, at Nick the Phantom, Chris Paliuka, uh, at Chris Paliuka. Uh, spell your name, dude. <laughs> C-H-R-I-S-P-A-G-L-I-U-C-A. And you can also find uh, me on Sports of Anarchy. The Twitter handle is at Sports of Anarchy. Of course. And, of course, fight fans, please, if you haven't already spread the word, MMA discussion is on Facebook again for anybody that doesn't know. We've actually seen a lot of pickup on traffic. Uh, since adding Chris Pell, you guys are admin. For those of you that don't know, yeah. he is an MMA discussion admin now. So, I, I, <laughs> since we never made that an actual announcement, you, now everybody knows. For anybody that listens, please. Uh, some interesting discussions on that. Of course, yeah, we've had a lot of good ones, and uh, hope you keep bringing in the traffic like you have thus far. So, uh, we appreciate you, fight fans. Uh, yeah. uh, again, uh, Dan, we really want to thank you for coming on. Where can people find you? Yes. Uh, just get, get at me on uh, Twitter at 18 Daniel Clark. Uh, thanks for having me, but lads, cheers. Appreciate you, man. We uh, we love having you on. You know, definitely like uh, getting more perspectives, especially from yeah. uh, um, especially from you know fans. So if uh, yeah. if at any point we have uh, any uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. I say he's welcome to come on at any time. Of course, let us know. We you know we'll yeah. have you on at any time. We appreciate you, fight fans. Watch the fight cards this weekend. Get excited. MMA is going to make a comeback, I feel. I think I know it's a dark time, but we got good times coming up real soon. We appreciate you. Love you. Everybody sign off. All right. Thanks again, guys, for listening.